drug abuse? Um, I should warn you, I'm working with a very sore throat, so uh, I'm going to try to do the best that I can. Um, so first off, thank you for having me here. Um, it's a real honor. Um, I'm going to be talking about implementing treatment as prevention in criminal justice settings. So just as background, uh, the U.S. has the dubious distinction of having the highest prisoner population rate, averaging roughly over 700 per 100,000 individuals. This is uh, considerably higher than uh, any other country in the world. What this translates roughly is uh, into a combined federal, state, local um, correctional population of over 7 million folks. And this has only been steadily increasing through the 80s, 90s, 2000s, and onward. Relevant for the meeting here and for NIDA's um, research interests, this is also a population that suffers significant substance abuse and alcohol um, related issues. As you can see here, 69% regularly use illicit drugs of any kind, 66% um, percent regularly use alcohol. Alarmingly, um, among regular users, only 40%, only 40% have received any form of treatment. Moreover, in addition to alcohol and other substance um, abuse issues, this prisoner population also struggles with significantly high rates of HIV, HCV, and TB. Unfortunately, screening, testing, and treatment, particularly for HIV and HCV, is in general fairly inadequate. The nice exception is that TB in prisoner settings um, actually tends to be, right here, fairly high. As you can also see, the rates are really um, horrible um, for HIV um, and HCV um, testing um, in jails and community correction settings. So obviously suggesting a need for improvement in both providing testing, treatment, and services for this population. So exactly where and how do we intervene in the criminal justice system? Um, what I want to lay out before you here is that the seek, test, treat, and retain model, which is NIDA's way of essentially calling treatment as prevention, is, is such a public health approach that we believe you can implement within the criminal justice system. As you can see from this um, diagram here, the STTR approach allows you to intervene at every juncture of the criminal justice process from arrest to a prosecution to a community reentry. So even though conceptually what I'm saying obviously, well, I don't know, obviously may make sense, um, there are a lot of questions regarding the feasibility and effectiveness of such an approach. Um, as Jacques talked about earlier, to address these specific concerns, NIDA in collaboration with NIMH and NIAID developed an initiative and subsequently um, funded 11 research centers in the U.S. and one in Vietnam to test different models of care and STTR approaches in the criminal justice system. These are uh, just some of the testing, treatment, services approaches that are being evaluated in these grants. Um, they really are a nice range. They're very heterogeneous. Some are targeted, some are broader. Um, so we are um, excited to see how this um, rolls out. Now, within this cluster of 12 grants, um, and recognizing that we are entitled, that we are in a tighter fiscal climate. NIDA has begun a process of data harmonization across these 12 grants, which essentially is this idea of pooling data across grants so that we can answer broader level questions that we really wouldn't necessarily have been able to answer just from one individual project. So we're harmonizing data across multiple key domains. So as you can see, drug use, um, access to care, adherence, et cetera, et cetera. 
um, using common measures and common um, in instruments across all, all of these 12 grants. This is just a quick graph to show you how we're slowly keeping track of this. These are the number of sites that are measuring all of our um, common domains. We also are tracking by modal time points um, what our grants um, are measuring as well. Let me also just say that in addition to the um, criminal justice grants, NIDA, again, as Jacques said earlier, um, funded an, an STTR for vulnerable population um, RFA, which resulted in 10 additional grants. So what we are actually doing is harmonizing data across the 22 grants and essentially looking at a pooled estimate of anywhere between 55 to 70,000 individuals. So in sum, and I know that this tends to be a slightly provocative meeting, so um, I might end with a thought. Um, I think it's important we get on the same page about what we mean when we say implementation science. As we begin to establish a program of STTR um, approaches and treatments that work for specific populations, we absolutely need to be thinking about how we're going to implement those. Um, from my vantage point, people throw around the word implementation a lot. And um, at least in the NIH research world, um, implementation science actually cares not very much actually about patient level outcomes, but it cares a lot more about outcomes having, having to do with um, clinician behavior, organizations, clinics, and systems. So I think the more that we can work to just get on the same page about um, the right jargon, um, I think the better off we will be. Um, here's my contact information, and I also provide